Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Mailbag. This is a show where we answer your viewer submitted questions. You email them to us at Collider video at gmail.com we pick them out and answer them on the weekend mailbag show or on a daily movie talk show uh i hope everyone had a good thanksgiving and ate a lot of food and maybe shopped a lot on friday i do a lot of my shopping online but i did go out and i'm joined by wendy lee how was your thanksgiving hi it was good i ate a lot of good stuff in mashed potatoes did some shopping online I'm happy. My wallet's not, though. <laughs> and we're also joined by Perry Nemiroff. Still feeling the effects of food coma, and I'm broke, so I think my <laughs> holiday was a success. Thank you for asking. Okay. All right, let's uh, move on to the first question. What do we got? All right. Whoa, a lot of uh, noises here. All right. Caleb writes, hey, Collider crew, I've been watching every show since the Man of Steel review with John Campia, Clark Wolf, and John Schnepp from the good old days of AMC Movie Talk. I began watching because of my love for superhero movies, but since then you have helped me find and appreciate many movies from various genres that I would otherwise have been unaware of or ignored. This leads into my question. If you had to choose to watch new movies from only one studio for the next 10 years beginning in 2017, which studio would you choose? During that time, you could continue to watch movies from any studio released before 2017. Afterwards, you could catch up on all the movies you missed. Thanks for taking my question. Well, that's a, mm -hmm. a tough question to answer because every studio puts out a variety of movies and a lot of different kinds of franchises and different qualities. You have different things that you love. Ultimately, it came down to kind of the same thing that, you know, we always people always want to talk about they want to talk about marvel versus dc mm -hmm. so the the two studios for me are disney versus warner brothers and but it's more than just marvel and dc you have disney where you have all the pixar animated films you have the disney animated films now you have these disney live action films uh you have obviously the marvel films and then of course star wars and then with warner brothers you have the dc films but not only that you have uh, Blade Runner is coming out, Tomb Raider, the whole Harry Potter Fantastic oh. Beast franchises from them, the Lego movies. They're partnered with Legendary to distribute uh, Godzilla, King Kong, uh, Pacific Rim. Also, WB is the place where most of Chris Nolan and uh, Ben Affleck's movies come from. I know Silence from Scorsese think it might be paramount but usually scorsese does stuff with warner brothers so the, anything that they output may come from warner brothers as well so it's it's a tough choice i mean ultimately i'm gonna have to choose disney just because i want to see what happens in the star wars universe even though i love the mcu and i love the dc eu and I want to see what happens with those. I'm more curious about the Star Wars episodes and, and the expanded universe and to see where they go with that. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be the best movies. I just am more curious about those. Perry? So this would have been an impossible question. I'm really glad <laughs> that the viewer put in that thing that during that time you can continue to watch, watch old that's, movies. That's very fair and thoughtful. Yeah. And it stressed me out just a little <laughs> less with this question. But... If I had to pick one studio, I would have to pick the thing where I would feel the need to, to see it now. And often that is important to me. It's like every time I hear about a film festival going on that I can't go to, it's not a big deal that I have to wait until the movie comes out. But there, there's so many movies where like, I, I really want to see it now. And I think the one thing I couldn't live without seeing immediately when it comes out is a Star Wars movie mm -hmm. at this point. Which kind of breaks my heart because as a horror lover, the second I choose Disney, there goes my favorite genre. Yeah. I, Disney does no. not nope. make horror films. So mm -hmm. that's a mortifying answer because of that reason. But given the little caveat, at least I could spend my 10 years going back and, you know, watching classics I've never seen, revisiting ones I love. So 
As much as I'll miss all my other studios, <laughs> I think I think my smartest move to keep me happy for those ten years is to go with Disney. Yeah, because you can still go back and watch Jurassic Park, exactly. you can still, which is Universal, and you can go back and watch Independence Day, which is Fox. And you can watch all those still because of his. I love how I, I, I pick these questions that that let stress parry out. You, yeah. like, you get very stressed out when, 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 when we propose these hypotheticals. I take these questions almost as seriously as I take the box office predictions. I, yeah. I, I think about I them tell. long and hard and I try to like pretend that it's real and I'm really actually putting myself in that headspace now. It's a little scary. Yeah. Wendy, what about you? What studio would you go with that you could only watch the next 10 years of movies? This was kind of an easy choice for me. Right off the bat, I thought Disney because mm -hmm. I will get all my Pixar's, all my animation, my mm -hmm. Star Wars, my Marvels. Um, it makes me sad that I won't be able to see like Wonder Woman and Spider-Man when that comes out, but at least I'll have Star Wars. Um, and like the one thing to me is I know everybody here at the studio loves Star Wars and it would be awful to work here. And like, let's just say I picked a different studio and I wouldn't be able to see Star Wars and I would have to literally walk around with my ears plugged because mm -hmm. it would be spoiled for me for 10 years mm -hmm. but I also don't want to miss all these live action remakes that they're making like Beauty and the Beast that would break my heart if I had to miss that in any of the other animations they have coming out no yeah. more Leica for you Oh, oh, it's okay. It's okay. I love Leica, but they only, they only make one movie every every what, four years four two or five or three years. years or whatever Something so like that. That's the, another the, thing about Disney is I think they're churning out more content than anyone. So mm -hmm. if you're stuck with one studio, I guess, wouldn't mm -hmm. you want the one that's producing the most amount yeah, of material? But you know what? Watch? If if Disney didn't have Star Wars, I, I would have picked Warner Brothers. I think with the with the DC Universe and then plus all those like kind of that's dramas. That's actually an interesting that second Brothers, question to this. What? If If Star Wars was not in play. I, I, I'd probably go with Warner Brothers then just because... Even though I know right now the Marvel Universe is, is at least for me, mm -hmm. uh, more uh, consistent with their quality mm -hmm. than DC Universe. You, with the with Warner Bros., you have all those other things like the, the Harry Potter franchise, Lego movies, like I said, Godzilla, King Kong, Pacific Rim. And then you have a lot of the Chris Nolan, Ben Affleck, Martin Scorsese movies that would come out of that studio where Disney doesn't have that. Yeah. Disney doesn't really focus much on that kind of adult drama. Mm -hmm. Uh, area. I'd be seriously torn. Okay. Like, I, I would lean towards Warner Brothers for a lot of the reasons you just said, but now I'm looking at the release <laughs> schedule like I don't wouldn't be okay without seeing the next Jurassic World movie. Uh, but that's universal. I know. That would keep you up at night if you couldn't see the next Jurassic World movie. Oh, wow. I think tonight Perry's going to be still thinking about this question. Like, she's going to lie in bed. I'm going to be thinking, about, thinking this about this question until next week's mailbag yeah. when I get another question to obsess over. No. All right, what's next? Dan writes, hey, Collider, this is Dan from India. Love watching Movie Talk daily. I think you guys are the best source of movie news on YouTube. Coming to the question, what do you think would make a movie successful? Word of mouth or strategic release date or getting big name stars to start in it like DiCaprio and Tom Cruise starring in a same movie. I mean, who wouldn't go see that movie? Anyway, would love to hear your thoughts on this topic. As always, keep rocking and may the force be with you. Well, back in the 80s and 90s, it would be easy to be getting the big star in the film and then you would almost guarantee some sort of box office return. Those days are over now. I mean, there are a few exceptions, you know. You can get like a Tom Cruise or, you know, some other. But I mean, you look look at Tom Hanks in Inferno. Tom mm -hmm. Hanks is one of the biggest stars in the world. That movie flopped. I mean, internationally it did pretty well, but at least here domestically it did terribly. So those that era is done with. And the big thing now is franchises. It's all about franchises. It's all about like, is this based on a popular comic book? Is this based on a popular book series like Harry Potter? Is it based, you know, Hunger Games? That's kind of what brings in the people. But I would say word of mouth is is mm -hmm. the thing because back in the day, you know, I'm, I'm an older person. So <laughs> back in the day, if you wanted to hear about a movie, you would hear about it either you read an, a review in a newspaper or a magazine you know this is before the internet or you'd have to talk to one of your friends that may or may not have seen it you know that's a very limited range of word of mouth you know um where nowadays it's social media how many sources do you hear about one single movie mm -hmm. you hear on twitter on facebook uh 
you hear uh, there's video reviews. We do video reviews, movie reviews. You hear, you know, website reviews like collider.com. You hear like a collective, like all these things coming at you. So there's like an overall consensus. Now there are things that, that people hear about that they never would have before because everything spreads so quickly and with, and with so many people. Uh, Perry? I totally agree with you and I'm really glad. I'm happy that it's come down to word of mouth at this point in terms of uh, big box office type productions though. Because I still think the, the getting a big name uh, actor to star in your movie could make all the difference for an independent movie that yes. Yes. might not get distribution, might not be on your radar whatsoever if your favorite actor wasn't in it. There's really something to be said for actors out there who say, all right, I'm going to pass up on the big studio movie, the big paycheck, and I'm going to do one just because I love it or I want to work with an up-and-coming filmmaker because that could put that movie on the map better than either of these other things can. But I think in terms of studio fare, we're definitely in a point where word of mouth... Word of mouth might not only be, well, definitely actually, isn't only a good thing to have for opening weekend, but going forward too. I mean, we're, we're constantly talking about opening weekend box office numbers, but let's not forget there's many, many more weekends, hopefully for a good movie to follow in the box office. There's DVD, Blu-ray, VOD. All of that stuff is only going to be better if it has a positive word of mouth buzz, whatnot spreading around. Yeah, I think bad word of mouth, like with Batman v Superman, hurt the, the box office. There was a lot of, more, some of my more casual fans, they heard, they hadn't seen it yet. They're mm -hmm. like, oh, I heard it wasn't that great. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't give them any reason to go to the theater, plunk down their money and sit there and watch it. But if they had heard like, oh my God, it's the best thing ever, blah, 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 you know? it's going to make a ton of money. There was a lot of good word of mouth for uh, Captain America Civil War. Mm -hmm. And everyone's like, the airport scene, the airport scene. Mm -hmm. And not everyone loved it, but I'd say generally most people did love the movie. And, and you know, and they were, then they passed it on almost like a, it's like a, a virus in a way. Like, you know, instead of a viral video, it's like viral word of mouth. It's like people keep talking about it and then gets passed on along and passed along. I mm -hmm. mean, Wendy, what do you think about the social media impact on today's kind of like word of mouth? I think it's bigger now than ever before. Um, in fact, every time I go on Snapchat, you know, like, like I'm totally obsessed with those Snapchat you love filters. Snapchat. <laughs> I sure do. And so now they have these filters that promotes movies. So even movies I don't know about or don't even care for it, it puts a little, you know, a little bit of hint in my head, like maybe you should check it out this weekend when you have nothing else to do, even if it's a movie that, um, you know, I'm not, I don't really care for. So if you want Wendy to see your movie, you make a cool Snapchat, Snapchat filter, <laughs> sold. Well, that's what <laughs> studios are they're paying for now. They're yeah. paying for these like daily filters mm -hmm. for these movies so that everyone are is using those filters and getting the uh knowing about uh, a film that's well, coming think out. about what they did with the uh the force awakens poster too like how much fun yeah. is something super simple and easy like that or the straight out of compton poster mm -hmm. where you can kind of turn yourself into a poster it yeah. sounds silly and dumb but it is a lot of fun and it gets the name out there quite a bit yeah one thing we we didn't talk about we talked about word of mouth we talked about big name stars the one part that, that he also asked was strategic mm -hmm. release date how how big a factor do you think that is because i think it, it it definitely influences the box office, but ultimately it's n probably the least important out of these three mm -hmm. to me, because we've seen movies go in certain, I guess, quote unquote, dead times or, or garbage dump times <laughs> and done decently well. Mm -hmm. I mean, last or not, earlier this year, you, know, you had Kung Fu Panda was at three or four or whatever, did pretty well in January. I remember American Sniper, even though technically it was released in, I think, Christmas, it, it went wide in January of that, that year and it made a ton of money. So I, I, I think the release dates are less of an influence. I think they're an influence. I think between the three things listed here, it's mm -hmm. just the most difficult to predict. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many times this year where I said, why would you release that movie, you know, a week after another huge movie comes out? But the, the problem is, and especially going forward, that's going to be even tougher to predict because 2017, and I think even worse in 2018, we have months where it's just back to back to back massive, massive releases yes. where even if a studio scored a release date and still to this day, and let's say they have a 2017 release date all to themselves right now, 
that doesn't mean as much as it used to because there's still something that's going to have a significant holdover that's coming out the week before. And then you know what else? There's going to be another huge box office potential movie coming out the week after. So maybe you're going to have a big opening weekend, but you're going to feel the effects of it one way or the other. So I don't know if... I, I don't know how much strategy could even come into play anymore just because the market is consumed by so many things. Yeah, and, and you mentioned, like, uh, competition. It's movies. One of the biggest competitions of movies isn't another movie released on the same day. It's the, the desire or the, the inclination for a person to just stay at home and watch mm-hmm. something on Netflix or binge a season of this or what. Oh, play video games. Video games, you know. Uh, take up a lot of time so it, it you're that's what you're battling now yeah. versus just battling another movie that comes out on either on the same day or the same week it's it's like you want to the battle is to get the consumer out of their out of their home and to actually make the make the effort to go to the theater i wonder how long that'll be the battle for before you can you pay know a premium price yeah and see the movie at pay home. for some premium subscription service sit at home and well, watch a new well apparently mark release. ellis is going to be hopping on that very <laughs> yeah. very soon I, it's 20 dollars a ticket <laughs> yeah i'm waiting for that that price to to go down and be a much more i mean i think we should all get like a friends and family discount don't you think 20 bucks anything i think we should go in at like half price you would think, but Mark Ellis is, you know, a ruthless man. A ruthless <laughs> man. All right, what's next? Condon writes, Now, maybe I'm still confused about the new Kyber Crystal Cannon, mm-hmm. but why the hell is the, di- the Death Star Beam green? As far as I understand about the new cannon surrounding lightsabers, Kyber Crystals, the color only changes when it's exposed to a Force user, maybe someone who is Force-sensitive, and only on the first exposure. And if a crystal is exposed to a Dark Side user, then their mere Dark Side presence will corrupt the crystal and make it turn red. Now, maybe the Death Star won't end up being powered by a giant kyber crystal, even though that's probably the most heavily favored rumor. And, uh, but if it is, then why the hell is the beam green? It's not like the people wanting to build the Death Star are going to do out of the kindness of their heart, so it should be red. Now, I guess it could just be that there are tons of people at the bottom of the ladder, men and women who work for the Empire, but just see it as a job to pay the bills, so to speak. Who would have been exposed the, to the crystals bringing it from Jeddah to the Death Star? But I thought it only changes when exposed to the four sensitive individuals, which is definitely possible as well. Another option being that long before the Empire claimed it, a Jedi was once exposed to the crystal, and it was green from that point on. Anyway, I guess we'll have to wait and see until Rogue One comes out and see if they, they'll explain it if they do at all. Thank you so much, and I hope you all have a great day. Uh, all right. Uh, before we answer this question, I want to mention that in, in a future episode of uh, Collider Crash Course, mm-hmm. there, we're going to be talking about kyber crystals and what they are and what they do so that'll be coming out soon uh for now can we throw up that spoiler alert graphic here all right so if you don't want to know anything about rogue one or kyber crystals you can kind of skip ahead to the next uh topic uh right now i know perry did you finish catalyst i did finish okay so so right now i'm reading or listening to the audiobook Mm -hmm. of the star wars catalyst novel which is basically a prequel to rogue one and it deals heavily with kyber crystals mm-hmm. and galen urso who is Jin urso which is felicity jones character in rogue one's father and he deals a lot with kyber crystals and, and getting the energy from that and he is working on or has what synthesized kyber crystals i haven't gone as far as you have what can you what can you tell us without Without huge, spoiling huge the book. spoilers. Because I just like, started it today. Yes. Well, it's it's easy not to spoil the book because there is no... Like, no one says in the book, this is why it's green yeah. or why it will be green. I imagine based on what I know of kyber crystals... Again, I don't know the, the factual answer to this question, but based on what I know... The way that that, uh, Jedis and Sith use them in the lightsaber, that is a situation where it's more attuned to to a Force user Mm -hmm. and why the color would change. It's like the Ahsoka thing where she had one that would have been red and then hers became white because she changed it. But I imagine when there's there's more uh, mechanical Mm -hmm. elements involved where it's not... Again, I, I don't know if this is true. For all I know, it is. But if it is, it'd be ridiculous. If there was just, you know, some Jedi or someone to make it green, you know, pressing the button to make <laughs> the Death Star fire the laser, maybe that would make it green. But 
I imagine that element of the kyber crystal and the light it emits would be taken away when you think about not like think about how Galen Erso and the rest of the developers behind the Death Star figured out how to harness and harness and then produce that kind of power. So I don't think we're playing by the same rules as yeah. color of a lightsaber here. Yeah, I don't think it's a necessarily a force sensitive person. It's I don't know. I mean, I haven't gotten far enough into the book, but maybe if if it's a synthesized crystal or it's something that they found maybe with uh, Galen Erso and all, all the rest of the people that are, are working on it, maybe that's how it changed. But uh, yeah, I, I think the, the green color is just has nothing to do with any kind of Sith uh, working on it. So yeah. Yeah. Um, Wendy. Yeah. You're, you're, I, you ju just I, just, I just barely started. I'm still on chapter one. So I'm only okay. about 20 minutes in. Okay. So I'm, I'm like on chapter 12 or 13 and then Perry is done. I'm going back and re-listening to some of it because it's one of those situations where when you see what they accomplish over the course of the book and mm -hmm. where they end up, if you go back and re-listen to some of the facts, it just, it makes you think or it makes you look at it in a new light. Mm. So it's it's actually worth going back and reading again. Yeah, and you, you and Christian are going to do a spoilers review yeah. of the the book. I'm very excited about okay. that. I'm very excited about all I gotta, Star Wars I gotta books. Finish, I got to finish, I got to finish, finish the book quickly, quickly, especially I'm, before Rogue One. I'm yes. curious to see how you think it compares to Lost Stars. Because okay. I know you Lost Stars is like up yes. there for you. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, which is, is excellent. I have Lost Stars, Bloodline, and then right now, I, I still, I even though I'm only partway through, I do have Catalyst above Lords of the Sith. But those are only okay. the four that I have. I'm, I'm okay Tarkin. with that. Where did you put Lords of the Sith? I love Lords of the Sith. Yeah. I'm I'm still Lost Stars number one. Mm -hmm. I think Catalyst might be after that, and then okay. maybe Bloodline Lords of the Sith. I also really okay. like Dark Disciple. I didn't okay. read that. That's that's a good one. And then I'm kind of obsessed with Half of Tarkin. Okay. All I was right. disappointed with Lords of the Sith. It's not. It wasn't. It's not. I thought I it was going to be but it really good, my, but yeah. yeah, I was just. Eh, it's all right. So sorry. All right, guys. So let's move on to the next one. Ari Cap writes, "Hi, Collider two, Crew. Two questions I have for you. Number one." When do you think Khan versus Godzilla will take place? I know Khan's uh, Skull Island takes place in 1971, and I know in the recent Godzilla movie, it shows footage from when he was born. I can't remember for sure, but I think that took place back in the 50s or so. So do you think they could cross paths during the 60s, 70s, or 80s? Possibly Godzilla could show up on Skull Island. Question number two, do you think they could possibly team up and fight monsters in another movie, or could they team up at the end of the versus movie? Would love to hear your thoughts. Perry? This is a think? great question because I'm surprised I haven't wondered this myself, given when uh, Kong Skull Island is set and when, you know, all the phases at least of the God the most recent Godzilla movie are set. You know, I don't know. I, do, do we know how far along in the process of scripting that new movie they are? Because I Which imagine... One? Godzilla versus? Yeah, the versus, versus movie. I don't... Do they even have a writer attached? I think think they might but i don't know how far there because remember they still got to put out godzilla 2 before they do godzilla I, versus king kong well i oh. definitely i definitely think we need to see kong skull island and then godzilla 2 if that is coming out before the versus movie before we can make any sort of educated guess here but i also wouldn't be surprised if they might hold off in making a decision like that to see how kong skull island is received mm -hmm. because you know many of us know at this point that the godzilla movie I, I liked it overall. I kind of didn't play favorites in terms of the sections and the time period as much as some other people did. But there there were a lot of movie goers, goers out there with strong opinions based on, you know, what they wanted in that movie. And it pretty much came down to whether you liked the material that took place earlier on or you wanted the, the, the more modern fighting material yeah. where you actually saw Godzilla. So... I think right now I'm going to hold off on guessing and say, let's see how Kong Skull Island comes out, what the reception is, and that might put us on a clearer path with this. Okay. I think that when they do Godzilla versus King Kong, they're going to set it in modern times because that way now we have Kong Skull Island, which is going to be the first of the Kong story in, in, in this universe. And Godzilla, we already seen, and they, they both have a, uh, I think what they want to do is be able to tell all these other individual stories before they meet up. So if 
if Kong is in 1970, now they can tell individual Kong stories the rest of the 70s, the rest of the 80s, the 90s, mm -hmm. the 2000s. And so there can be all this story or movies that you can have before he meets up with Godzilla. Because, you know, watching that first Godzilla movie, you would figure if Godzilla and King Kong did had a battle before then that someone would have noticed because the whole thing was that they, that Godzilla, I think, was dormant for a while uh until he came out yeah and in so until um i think i think the the first incident that happened was in the 50s mm -hmm. and then it isn't until 99 that he causes that problem with uh with brian cranston's wife in the yeah. facility yeah so i just feel like they, they that will give them time to have their own individual story so they can keep making individual solo movies and then have godzilla and, and king kong they have to fight in the first one. I mean, there's no point in, you know, it's great if they want to team up and fight something bigger later on, but they have to fight each other. Otherwise, there's no purpose to Godzilla versus King Kong. Well, if uh, the director of Kong Skull Island has anything to say with it about this, we'll likely get fighting in, and creatures in the future movies early on. That's like one of the reasons I'm, I'm most excited about Kong Skull Island is that quote that he gave, which is essentially the opposite of Gareth Edwards' Godzilla movie, which again, I liked, but I like the idea, you know, if I'm seeing a Kong movie, I want to see some Kong yeah. early mm -hmm. on. And that was the quote he gave uh, Jordan Vote Roberts, where he said, you know, I'm not playing by that game where you got to wait 40 minutes to see the monster. So, man, that trail, I'm so ex I didn't realize that I could be so excited about this franchise right now, but that trailer for Kong is might be one of my favorite trailers of 2016. Oh, nice. All right. Uh, what's next? Levy writes, hello, Collider crew. I have a theater etiquette question for you. I am a man with the bladder of a toddler. Basically, I'm like the leaky faucet in your apartment that the landlord just ignores. Anyway, I love going to the movies and prefers to sit dead center. My question is, if I know I'm going to have to scoot my way out of the aisle at least twice during a movie, is it inconsiderate of me to sit in the center of the theater? Thank you. P.S. Tell Tony Ravioli, Ricky Tortellini, sleep with the fishes. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh... This question, I empathize with you as a person who goes to the theater and also is concerned about, you know, needing to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. I don't like missing out on film, so I try to do my best to not. That's why I don't buy like huge drinks. And even if I do have drinks in there, I'm, I'm sipping them moderately in there. <laughs> I'd say if you're going to go twice, don't sit in the middle. Look, I give everyone, including myself, a pass to, to, to get up and walk out one time in the movie. But if you are in the dead middle and I see you pass me twice, if you could leave, go to the bathroom and then go back, but then like 30 minutes or 45 minutes later, you get up and go again, I, then I kind of feel like that's bad movie etiquette. If you, you should then sit on the outside. That's just my feeling. Perry? As much as I hate to deny this viewer the opportunity to sit in the perfect seat and see the movie his way, yeah, you don't do that. I will always make stinky faces at people who get up and pass me in the middle of a movie. And it always takes... Even once. You no. Don't, you don't give them a pass. See, I give no. them that one pass because I, I do it myself. But two is I, just way too much. I give them a pass. It doesn't stop me from making my stinky face, okay. though. It still annoys me. <laughs> it annoys me, but I, I can't blame them because it's natural. We all, when you got to go, you got to go, you know? Yeah. But um, but no, I will, I will deprive myself of drink during a movie and... I will hold it until it's inappropriate <laughs> to hold it and I can make myself sick, but I will not get up and go to the bathroom during a movie because I need to see the whole movie. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I try my best sometimes, but then, then there's other times where I'm like, oh man, this is a boring part of the movie. Mm -hmm. It's usually when, when some of the romance stuff, the really forced romance stuff happens in like a movie that's not like a romance film. Like it's like, 
an action adventure and they decide to like squeeze in this romance part and i'm like all right unnecessary time to, time to go to the bathroom if i did that i would just walk out of the movie and never stop worrying that i missed the most important scene it's well like, well that's the thing is i know that's not the most important part of the movie because it's deep force- down i know these things too but recently i got to a screening and i was maybe a minute late to the point where when i had walked in it was still the the opening title credits mm-hmm. but it was opening title credits where the the names of the actors were popping up over footage so for like the first 15 minutes of the movie until i forgot about it i sat there worrying just i probably missed like a great cold open or something yeah. didn't I, odds are i did not no. but i still no. sat there and worried it worried yeah. about it well, most movies don't start off with a bang like a you know Tarantino movies you start out like you don't want to miss the beginning of a Tarantino movie because they always yep. start off very very uh, big uh, mm-hmm. Wendy what about you what are your rules for do you, do you think it's okay for a person that sits in the, the dead center mill to go to the bathroom twice <laughs> and okay, okay. If, if they go twice <laughs> They better go one side one way and one side the <laughs> other way, right? Just divide it evenly yes. amongst the theater. Um, I am such a movie-going snob where I go and I have my popcorn and my drink, and I want people to be quiet, no talking on the phone, to pull your cell phone, none of that crap. You're going to talk, get out. Um, so I feel like it is more considerate for you to sit towards the edges of the theater. Uh, Mark Ellis does this because he likes to run to the bathroom mm. multiple times at a screening because I'm always like, why don't you want to sit in the middle and get the best experience? And he's like, no, I have to get up to the bathroom. I'm like, oh, so now whenever we save seats for him, we save it for him at the edge. But here, here's the thing too, and I think some people might argue with this. It's like, well, I'm paying for that $12 just like anyone else. So why am I not allowed to get up at least twice to go see? Well, it's, movie, yeah, it's movie etiquette. It's not a, yeah. they're not going to kick you out mm-hmm. for it, but you will get the stink I do eye. Make, I do make stinky faces just like Perry. Well, actually, I'm more like, oh, I, I See, make it known that okay. I'm unhappy. I'm like, you're crossing in front of me again. It's like when you move your legs to let them go past. It's I not don't. as simple as just, <laughs> yeah, it's like you make the, the most minimal amount of effort to actually You bend your ankle just a little bit over. Like, you can pass, right? Okay. <laughs> Oh, Perry, you're such a nice person. I didn't know you were so mean to people during movies. It's dark. Movies. No one can see as me. Yeah. Because, like, to me, it's like one time is fine. Everyone, in, but, yeah, if, if I see someone get up twice, then then I would start getting upset. You know, there's an app where there used to be uh, that went that was integrated with the AMC. It tells Run you P. what, yeah. Yeah, it's is, called Run P. Yeah, yeah. I, I do remember and this. I bet you it's you always at it. those forced romantic scenes between. Or the what do you hate scenes. romance? <laughs> romance is great. You, you know, we just saw La La Land and it is a romantic film. That, that There's that, a movie that, that you don't get to late. No, you don't want to leave. Yeah. But that movie is about romance. I'm talking about it's an action adventure. And they There's, shoehorn. Come on. Chris Hemsworth, Natalie Portman, and Thor. Like Some people uh, might want to see that. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, there was no chemistry between them at all. Oh, the worst was... Uh, we we talked about Inferno earlier, but the the Da Vinci oh. Code, mm. Tom Hanks and Audrey Tattoo. Oh, there was like zero chemistry between the two, but there was like this forced romance between yeah. them. <laughs> terrible, terrible. <laughs> Dennis hates love. Uh, uh, apparently. <laughs> All right, let's go to the last question. Kathy writes, "Hey, Collider Crew, being a film critic, can you even watch movies and simply enjoy them without analyzing the individual parts? I'm a big theater fan, and once I did an internship in a theater and saw what all the processes are like and what goes on behind the scenes. Ever since then, whenever I watch a play now, I find myself analyzing lighting choices, blocking of scenes, costume choices, music cues, and so on. I still enjoy that a lot, but it's just not the complete escapism anymore that it was before. Did you have any of the same experience with movies? Can you still watch movies just for enjoyment, or is that part of your brain still always running along? If so, do you think that's a bad thing, or does it maybe even heighten your experience? Personally, I sometimes find it annoying because it occasionally gets in the way of complete emotional investment. But sometimes I also notice things this way that might have passed me by otherwise and give me a deeper understanding of the whole piece. How is it for you when you are not watching movie, a movie for work? Thanks for bringing us the great content. You are awesome. Well, whether I watch a movie or television show for work or not, I'm my brain is always on. You're, you're always going to, and I understand his, his, 
his perspective. Once you start learning about movies, there's you have a different perspective. Now you know like how the lighting's done. You know mm-hmm. how the camera movements. You know how all these different things. But you can still enjoy the movie just for movie's sake. And I think that's really dependent on the filmmaking and the storytelling and the director and the actor. Are they sucking you in with, with their performance or with the way the story's told, the sound design? Because the best directors, once you start watching their movies, you're watching it and the more, the better they are at it, the more you get sucked in and you stop thinking about those things. And so I, I, I still have both parts of my brain running. I can still enjoy it. and I at the same time still analyzing. I think the main thing is maybe those little things that maybe you you maybe didn't notice before that you now notice and those might bother you or take you out of the film, but I you know, you could still watch a good popcorn film and and enjoy it. Uh what about you, Perry? It's it's a hard question to answer because I think it changes every single time. I definitely agree with you that the the best feeling ever is that when a movie is so engrossing you just completely lose yourself in every minute of it. And I've, you know, I've obviously had that happen. And then I walk out after and that's when I'll stop and think, oh, you know, the cinematographer did a great job. The, the score there was excellent. But, you know, I wasn't thinking about that necessarily in the moment to the point where it was taking me out of the story. There's often times, though, and I, this is just on the top of my head because we were talking about Kong. But, you know, the Kong Skull Island trailer where I guarantee you when I watch that movie, those images that I pointed out and said those were stunning frames. I'll bet you that when I watch the movie, I'll be I'll I'll sit there and at whatever moment those pop up, I'll be like, that's beautiful imagery right there. Mm-hmm. That's not necessarily my critic brain working. I think no matter what I was doing in life, I probably would have stopped and said to myself, that's mm-hmm. a pretty picture. But, you know, the more experience you get, it's kind of hard to block all of that out, especially if you've had any experience yourself making movies. Like when I first started doing this and reviewing movies, it was very easy to review as a casual moviegoer who had absolutely no insight to the process of filmmaking whatsoever. The second I went to film school and came out, it became nearly impossible to watch a movie without thinking about all of the behind the scenes challenges that went on. And that does not take away from my enjoyment of a movie from a pure entertainment perspective at all. It it really doesn't in unless it's a negative type of thing, you know, like like Independence Day Resurgence. Mm. Not to bring it up over and over, but having had experience making a movie when you're fighting so hard for every single penny, every single minute that you put on screen, every single piece of equipment to see a big budget like that completely blundered. You know, you can't help mm-hmm. but to look at a movie like that and be a little upset in that in that respect. But still to this day anyway, as a film critic, I always think to myself, because this is why I got into this from the start, is I want to be a film critic, but I want to I wanna criticize everything from the casual movie goer perspective. I want to view everything as, as what it's meant to be, entertainment. So I feel like every single time I review something, that's always at the heart of it. I, I do always reference technical achievements because I think that's important and I think people should be aware of those things. But as, as a critic, like my heart and soul is always, always about the entertainment value of a movie. Uh, Wendy, what, what do you think? I mean, I, I don't really consider myself, well, I definitely don't consider myself as, as a critic, and I haven't had the experience, um, the two of you, but I do feel like being in this environment, when I go in certain movies, um, especially ones that I really look forward to, I do have the tendency to look at it with a little bit more of a critical eye. And, and for me, it's not so much like the lighting and the effects, because I don't have personal experience working in those fields, but it's more for like the chemistry between the actors and how the line's delivered and stuff like that, because... Um, I studied acting, so I think that's where like the more critical stuff comes in for me. Yeah, and even the stuff that people don't know about, all that stuff affects you subconsciously. I mean, mm-hmm. if you're a casual moviegoer, I mean, bad acting is bad acting. Mm-hmm. That's gonna hit you yep. no matter what. It's gonna take you out of it, and it's it's a, a question. It's not a question of like, ooh, you're being a critic or whatever. You, you, this is you're getting presented a mm-hmm. story, and whether the story is told well or not is. You know that's up to you but 
you can't just totally disregard something and just be like, all right, well, I'm just going to turn my brain off. One of the coolest experiences I ever had in school was the, so the program I was in, they made you do, uh, you eventually chose a track and I chose producing. But at the beginning, all the producers, the screenwriters and directors have to take the same classes, Mm -hmm. which I think is a brilliant idea. But anyway, first semester, one of the first courses you take is a class called directing the actors. And one of the first assignments you do is not directing an actor yourself, but you have to act in it. And then the professor directs you because it's it's not like I ever didn't have respect for actors, but I grew up thinking, oh, yeah, like, that doesn't look that hard. I can pretend, read a I line. Can pretend yeah, to be yeah. another thing. Mm-hmm. Having that experience completely changed the way that I view the craft of acting. Because yeah. I'll tell you, when I got up there and I did that, I felt freaking miserable. <laughs> I didn't, I really, it's like, you know, like in situations where you just can't control like the level of your voice or the way your body moves. And it's a thing that you can't quite process the way you could process other things. I just couldn't understand in that moment why I couldn't act the way I wanted to act or the way I pictured it. But anyway, immense respect for actors after that. Yeah. All right, guys, that's it for this episode of Collider Mailbag. Remind you, there isn't another episode Tomorrow, uh, I like to thank people joining me at the table today. Wendy, where can people find you? You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple Channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat with all those filters at Wendy Lee Zaney. <laughs> Perry, uh, you guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. Collider Nightmares every Wednesday morning. We have Best of the Week every Saturday, not this Saturday though. There's also the Walking Dead recap show, which I'm on. Dennis is a regular <laughs> on it. Mine blown. And then we also are finishing up our Ash vs. Evil Dead recap show as well after Ash. So check that out, too. Uh, thanks to Adam and Cody in the back. Um, hopefully you guys had a <laughs> great Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, you can find me on Movie Talk on Fridays, Mailbags on Saturday like today. Yes, The Walking Dead reviews on Sundays. And then some various reviews. I think me and Perry reviewed like Moana, Manchester by the Sea, trailer reviews and reactions. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Think Hero, or Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Collider Videos, and we'll see you guys next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.